it certainly is, is good to be with you this morning, to share in this way. When you purchase a vehicle or an appliance or a power tool, ladies, a sewing machine, and the list could go on, what you get with that purchase is, for most times, is an owner's manual. A book that will tell you, if you take time to read it, how to properly use and to maintain this, your recent purchase. And the owner's manual can be helpful, tells you if you have questions about your item, tells you what to expect when you're using it, and how to fix it if there is a, a malfunction. Most schools, if not all of them, have a parent and student handbook. This one is from Shalom. We sat here for many, many years. And in this book, you'll find a list of expectations or requirements for attending this school. You might find a section on attendance, uh, probably dress code, conduct, and a lot more. You know, if you want to attend this school, here's our list of expectations and or requirements. Uh, it's all here. You look through this and you'll know, uh, I just see a grading scale. It's all there. You want to know what, have some answers, some questions. There is your answers. It gives you the information you need to be a good student and also a good patron family to the school of your choice. Maybe when you started your job, you were given a handbook. Uh, again, a list of expectations. Okay, here we have, if you want to work here, here's the details of your starting time, time that we generally quit, how long your lunch break should be, and what time it should be, and so on and so forth. But now, to switch gears a little bit to our spiritual lives, do, do we have um, a handbook or a, a manual for our Christian journey through life? Is there a list of requirements or expectations? And the answer is yes, there is. And not to downgrade the Word of God and call it a, a handbook. It is the Bible. It's the Holy Word of God. But God tells us what He expects. And He gives us uh, the requirements that He wants from us. I like the verse in 2 Timothy 3, 6. Very familiar. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So God wrote this book for us uh, through men that He inspired. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So you're here this morning, and you say, well, I have a desire to walk through life in, and live in a righteous life. Well, then the answer to that will be, if you have that desire, is to read the Word of God. God gave us his, his handbook, and we are to read that so we know exactly what he expects from us. Last Sunday, Sunday school lesson, we saw how Moses found grace in the eyes of God. In our Sunday school lesson, I asked the question, well, what's required to find grace in the eyes of God? And this morning we could look at that and we could say, well, it's not complete obedience to his word, a, a key ingredient. So God gave us his word, said, here you are, brothers and sisters. This is what I expect to see. This is what I require from you. In June, just uh, we looked at the account of David and some of the children of Israel moving the Ark of the Covenant. And we saw how a man was struck dead for touching the ark. And I come back to that again if you allow me to. And the question could be asked, why? And the answer is, is disobedience. Why? Well, God told us in his word and told the, 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 the people there, do not touch this ark. And disobedience, and he died. This morning, we're going to go to the New Testament and going to go to the book of Revelation. I'd like to go and look at chapter 2 and 3 this morning in the book of Revelation. You can turn there. And what we see here in chapters 2 and 3 is the Lord is giving personal messages to the seven churches on the west coast there uh, of Asia Minor. And each letter, I'm not going to take time to read both chapters, uh, familiar to most of us, but each letter begins with the Lord 
He starts by introducing himself. He says, you know, I am the first and the last, the Son of God, he that is holy and true, the Amen. So he tells them who he is, and then to each church he also um, starts out by saying what is the same for us today. And you can look at verse, in chapter 2, verse 2. He tells every church this, I know thy works. Verse 9, I know thy works. Verse 13, I know thy works. And we could go on four more times. Jesus is telling us, telling the churches there in, in, this, in the book of Revelation, and for us this morning, brothers and sisters, I know your works. And I kind of got hung up on that when I was studying this. I know your works. And we have said this across this pulpit numerous times. I think it's fit to say one more time. We cannot hide anything from God. So God says, brothers and sisters, here's, your requ- here's my handbook for you. Here's what I want you to do to follow. But by the way, brothers and sisters and Leon, I know what you're doing. And just, just a reminder for each one of us. We're going to look at the, the letter he wrote to the churches. He says, here's some good points. Brothers and sisters, you're doing great. Then he said, but here's a few things I want you to change. Jumping ahead of myself, but I come back to the point. I know what you are doing. You might be able to violate this little student handbook at school for a few days, although I'm sure you'll never try, but we're never we're unable to hide anything from God. God knows our works. He is aware of what we are doing. The man helping David move the ark, he just quickly slipped his hand out for a second or two, might I add, and he lost his life. God saw what he did. God was aware of his deed, and he died. How did God know? And we could stop him and park there for a while and say, how does God know this? Let me read a verse from Luke 12, 7. But even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So God knows something about me that I don't even know, and I'm sure it's the same for you. How many are up here? No clue. But God knows. And if he knows that, which to me is very insignificant, yet God knows that, what about everything else that we do? I repeat, I know your works. God knows all about us. The the message title this morning is Requirements from God's Handbook. Requirements from God's handbook, again, three points. Point number one, the report. Point number two, the remedy. And point number three, the reward. The report, the remedy, and the reward. So God knows our thoughts, our deeds, and our actions. He knows that there is something in our life that needs attention. So the report is what God saw in the churches. The report is what God saw in the churches. The remedy is God's loving hand of compassion reaching out in mercy to save the people from the air of their way. And the reward is God's promise for all who love, follow, believe, and obey his word. So as we go through this, may we be inspired by God's mercy, motivated by the reward that is waiting for all who faithfully follow his handbook. So we see the report. Like I said earlier, I'm not going to read them all, but for each church, the report begins on the positive side. Here's a few. Yes, I know what you're doing. You do not tolerate evil. I hear you're being blasphemed. I see you have not denied the faith. I notice your love, patience, and faith. You have kept my word. You have not denied my name. Just a few of the Lord's, uh, what he tells each church. Positive points. You guys are doing a good. Positive, motivating encouragement. You're standing strong in the faith. You're shunning wrong. You're clinging to that which is right. You're persevering in the faith. Well done. Keep pressing on. Then I had to wonder, what would the Lord, in the future, if you have a clean car, park it over there. If you have a dirty car, park it out front. That there glare again. Somebody close that one door, please. I'm having trouble with my notes. Just the, the door on, on, on my right, if you could close that, I would block off that clean car out there. I look up, I look back down, I can't see what I'm looking at. 
positive, motivated encouragement. And I wonder what the Lord would write about my faith. What would the Lord say about, write about Myerstown Church? Do you ever think about that? We can sit here this morning and say, well, here's seven churches that he said, thank you. Here's seven churches that he said this and this about. What would he say about Myerstown Church? What would he say about my faith? What would he write about you? What would he write about me? Then he, uh, the report switches to the, to the condemnation side. Okay, you're doing well in a number of areas, but here are some areas that need improvement. Two of the seven churches did not receive a negative report, but the other five, thanks Nate, but the other five were given some room for attention. So following the, the word of the positive report, we see other words like this. So he said, you're doing good. Then he used words like nevertheless, and you kind of know what's coming. He said, you're doing good, but you're excellent notwithstanding, okay? Or I have found thy works, I have not found thy works perfect before God. Or the word, the words, so then. So here's a good report, and here's what is to come. The report changes, and we're given a list of deeds and actions that need correction. So here we go. In chapter 2, verse 4, you have left your first love. Referring to the warm love and joy that they had been known for. Left implies an intentional act of leaving, not something that happened by accident. You have left your first love. You are following false doctrines. So here we, condemnation, church, you're following false doctrines. Now, um, worship of pagan gods. Church, there's fornication among you and you are condoning it goes back to what he said earlier. I know your works. You have a name that is alive, but you are not. You are not perfect before God. So maybe these churches, after he saw the report of the, the positive words, they thought, oh, we're doing okay. Then he comes back with words of condemnation. Chapter 315, you are not cold and you are not on fire for the Lord. Your condition is lukewarm and you're causing a bad taste in my mouth. And we know what happens there. So what we see here is not a report that anyone would want to hear. But it was truth from the Lord and change was required. The Lord did not give them this side of the report and, and then forsake them and say, well, I'm done. It's finished. You crossed the line. No. Sin is sin. And continual sin is unacceptable in the Lord's eyes. But he does not want to see his children die spiritually. So what did he do? He provided a remedy for them to help them in their current spirit, uh, spiritual condition. We serve a God that has a desire to see all his children come to repentance. All of them. He doesn't want to see one soul die an eternal death, but wants all to come to him. So he gave them a remedy for his condition. Uh, church, God gave his handbook to us so we can have clear direction through life. There's clear direction in this, this handbook, but there's also clear direction in this handbook. In this handbook, disobedience to his word will bring consequences, but there will be a reward for the overcomers. I think that's the first time I said the word overcomers, but that's coming more. It's an exciting word. There's a reward for the overcomers. Point number two, we see that was the report. Point number two is the remedy. And the remedy was a, a four-step process. And we see that remedy given in, uh, the remedy is, the first thing is repent. Chapter 2, verse 5. Remember where thou art fallen and repent. Verse 16, repent. Three, or chapter 3, verse 3. Hold fast and repent. And chapter 3, verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be there, zealous therefore and repent. We see Jesus telling these churches that repentance is required. To repent is to uh, feel or express sincere regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin. Repentant, uh, repentance includes taking personal accountability for past actions. I am wrong. 
I need to uh, repent. It's accepting the blame for the wrong, not trying to pass the action on to another. Repentance also means to stop completely and to turn away from whatever has pulled you away from Christ. Then you turn back to him and traveling on that newfound path that leads to righteousness. What does this look like? Jesus told the church at Ephesus, he said, remember from where you have fallen. So you, they were doing well, but excuse me, but they fell away. And Jesus is saying, church, remember from where, where you were and turn around and go back there. Repent of your actions. A lack of communication with the Lord will cause a breach in your relationship with the Lord and the need for repentance. A lack of communication will cut off our flow of our relationship with the Lord and there will be a need for repentance. So I bring it up again. Remember the Lord knows what we are doing. And the question could be asked, are we growing in our spiritual walk with him? So the a remedy to gain the reward is to repent and repent where repentance is needed. What Jesus is looking for here is genuine repentance, personal brokenness. Allow me to add, fourth re forced repentance is not repentance. It's simply a reluctant action in attempt to please others. But Jesus is looking for a genuine repentance, which is personal brokenness. Jesus wants us to admit where we are wrong and repent from the bottom of our heart. Remedy number one, repent. Number, uh, the second remedy uh, is hold fast. Uh, we find that in chapter 3, verse 3, where we're told, remember where thou uh, what thou hast received and heard and hold fast. And also same chapter, verse 11, behold I come quickly, hold fast that which thou hast that no man take thy crown. And when I, had a, when I thought of holding fast, my mind went to the verse in Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Brothers and sisters, we, chain, we train, I'm sorry, we train our children in the way that they're going to go. That way when they get older, they will hold fast to what they have been taught. Hold fast. Are we holding fast to sound doctrine? To the center core of the gospel message. Yes, we're living in a day of deception and falling away. But let's not compare ourselves with others, but rather be among those who are growing in their walk with the Lord. Yes, a day of falling away. But to make a change, you need to be the change. Is that you? Are you going to be the change in society today? Or go with the flow? No, we're not. We're going to be the change. Is that, is that change going to start with you? It, it may require standing alone, but are our sights set on heaven? There is no greater goal. Is that what we're focused on uh, throughout our days? Yes, there's other, other uh, priorities that arise, but are our sights set on heaven? I think the main uh, key here is that we need to be example that we want others to follow on their journey with the Lord. Are you being a positive example to those looking on? And when we think of holding fast, I think a message for us this morning is that the Lord is looking for faithfulness. The Lord is looking for a group of faithful people. And will you be among that number as well? Are you going to hold fast to the truth? Each one of us must make a clear decision for Christ. And holding fast to the truth may lead to persecution. We talked about that in our Sunday school lesson. But we must overcome the fear uh, that we're living among and learn to trust in God for whatever he allows to come our way. Now it comes back to just a childlike faith and trust. Because we remember the same God who notices that when a sparrow falls, is also can be counted upon to properly care for his obedient children. Are we putting our trust in God? The third point is here. He that hath an ear, let him hear. And Jesus gave this remedy seven times to each of the seven churches uh, that were in these two chapters. Jesus is telling us, if you have an ear, hear. So it's a way of 
speaking used by Christ when something serious or of great importance is being said. What is he telling us now? Pay close attention. Listen carefully to what he is saying. We all have ears, two of them, and we have reading comprehension when we read. Are we applying the words of Jesus uh, to our daily lives? And what we see here is Jesus looking for commitment and dedication to his word. Are we committed to the word when we read it and study it and meditate it? Does it change our lives? There is a difference between uh, reading the Bible, then laying it aside for the day, and reading the Bible and taking his word with us throughout the day. The difference is whether we, we hear and apply the message or hear but refuse it to allow it to change our lives. Are we taking God's handbook and saying, oh, God, I saw this today. This is what you want me to do. Are we applying it to our lives? Not just read it as a routine and impress on, but are we applying it to our daily lives? He that hath an ear, let him hear. And the fourth point for the remedy is to overcome. And uh, to him that overcometh. And brothers and sisters, this word is exciting. The promises in these two chapters are for those that overcome. Verse 7, to him that overcometh, and then what? Then he has the promise. Uh, verse 11, to him that overcometh, and 17, and so on and so forth. Are we here this morning? Do you consider yourself an overcomer? Have you overcome anything in your life? The promises that we're going to look at shortly are for given to those who overcome. So the word overcome has the idea of a conflict or a struggle. Obviously, you can't overcome something that's not there. So you go through life, you have a struggle or you have a conflict, and you overcome it. So the person that, who overcomes their struggle and, and conquers their conflict will gain the victory over everything that pulls him or her attention away from the heart of Christ. So you go through life and there's something that was pulling you away from Christ. You overcome that and you press on. So while the overcomer may still be a face temptation, and we may need to deal with that on a daily basis, we will not fall back into the same sin that we overcome because that victory has been won. Our lives have been cleansed by the blood of Christ, and that sin is no longer alive. Victory has been claimed. The overcomer is in the victory lane. As a songwriter wrote, yield not to temptation for yielding to sin. Each victory will help you some other to win. We're in the victory lane. And victory is waiting for all who are willing to forsake wrong and to cling to that which is right. And the verse of promise, 1 John 4, 4, You are God, little children, and have overcome them. We're on the victory side. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So the strength and power to overcome is found in Christ and in Christ alone. You're saying, well, I can't get out of this. Turn to the Lord. Go to his handbook. <clears throat> Victory is found in Christ and in Christ alone. We talked early, earlier about faithfulness. The overcomers are all who remain faithful to Jesus Christ. Those who hold fast to the truth... Though trials may come, they hold fast until the end. Jesus said, when I return, will, there be faith, will there, he be able to find faith on the earth? Are you with that number? You'll be faithful until the end. Will you be found a faithful overcomer? Those who, are over, are, who overcome are defined as people who believe in Jesus Christ. The overcomers and revelations are characterized by their resolve, demeanor, and ability to overcome obstacles. So we're, we're not, we're looking here this morning at the opposite of quitters. Quitters say, I can't, and give up. The overcomers conquer and live in victory. And the promises, again, we're going to look at shortly, are promised to the overcomers, to those living in victory, not those who continue living in defeat. So what do we do? We need to repent, if repent, where repentance is needed, hold fast to the truth. Hear the word of God and be an overcomer. Jesus Christ is looking for an uncompromising stand against evil. 
And yes, I said we're living in a day of, uh, of fault deception and falling away. I think we agree to that. But we're also living in a day when people compromise. Well, I can get by with this. The administrator is not going to see. No, Jesus Christ is looking for an uncompromising stand against evil. Will you be found in that number? I will not go there, do this, or do that, because Christ does not want me to do that. Remember his feeling towards a lukewarm church. You're not hot, you're not cold, you're, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Where are we at? The overcomers will not get entangled with the thought process of mainstream society, but will serve the Lord with their whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, with their sights on the eternal reward. I repeat, God gave his handbook to us for clear direction through life. Disobedience to his word will bring consequences and there will be a reward for the overcomers. And that's where we're at. The third point is the reward. You know, we think about heaven and there's nothing more than the death of a loved one that will make us think more about that. But we think about heaven, then we think about why we're serving him. And we serve the Lord because of our relationship with him and our desire to please him. And we love him because he first loved us. And while that's reason enough to live a righteous life, there's more. The children of God have the hope of eternal life. We're here for a very, very short period of time. And then we're going to step into eternity. The troubles and trials that we face on this side of eternity are a brief time. Then comes eternity. Then comes the crown. Then we'll see the streets of gold. Then we'll have to be able to meet with those who have gone on before. And, the, and on the top of the list is the main goal, that it's meeting Jesus Christ face to face. That promise is for those who are found faithful. That is for the promise for the overcomers. Revelation 2.10. Be thou faithful unto death. Okay, we, we talked about that. Here's another promise, and I will give thee a crown of life. Jesus speaking says, I will give. So just let your mind enter the, the glory gates, and here comes Jesus with a crown and sets it upon our head. Jesus Christ himself will present the crown. The faithful will not fear the judgment of God. They will not be separated from God, but they will be welcomed into his glory. And what a day that will be. Let's take a few minutes here and look at the overcomer's reward. And there we, I'll look at one in each, in each of the churches that he gives to each of the churches. Uh, the overcomer's reward, the first one is chapter 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear, but the Spirit saith unto the churches, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I will give to eat of the tree of life. This reward is not limited to just a certain people group, but to all who are overcomers. I will give to eat of the tree of life. So try to picture this scene in your minds, the home awaiting you in heaven, sitting by the table that is set, prepared, and being served by Jesus Christ from the tree of life. And what we have here is a reward for the overcomer. First one we see, I will give of the tree of life. Look at verse chapter 2, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. I will not be hurt of the second death. All those who stand strong in their faith through persecution and suffering will experience the resurrection of life. You know, many of us here this morning, maybe all of us, will experience physical death. But the faithful overcomer will have no need to fear spiritual death and separation from God. Instead, we're looking forward to eternity with our Lord someday, very, very soon. The second reward, we will not be experienced the second death. The third one is found in chapter 2, verse 17. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. And will give him a white stone, and a white stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. I will give to eat of the hidden manna. We studied about the manna of the children of Israel 8 in our recent Sunday school lesson. 
But the hidden manna here is speaking of the spiritual nourishment that will satisfy our deepest hunger, which should be our sufficiency in Christ in contrast to the attractions of the world. The overcomer will be given spiritual nourishment, which is Jesus Christ himself, which is eternal life, complete satisfaction in the presence of our maker. So just shortly we'll probably have a meal. Maybe in about eight hours we'll have another one. Tomorrow morning some might have another one. But when we get there, Christ is going to just be our spiritual. We'll have complete satisfaction when we're there with Christ. I will give to eat of the hidden manna. Next one we see is in chapter 2, verses 26 and 28. Him that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, I will give him power over the nations. And verse 28 I will give him the morning star, power over the nations and the bright morning star. The overcomer will be given a position of authority along with Christ in his kingdom. So it's not that we're here looking for a higher level, level of, of authority, but here we see we are one with Christ, working together with Christ in his kingdom, assisting him in his work. So get the picture, side by side with the Lord. Someday, soon. Jesus Christ himself is a bright morning star, and the overcomer will receive Jesus Christ forever and ever, never to be separated from him again. Brothers and sisters, there is coming a day. Go to chapter 3, verse 5. Him that overcometh, the same will be clothed in a white raiment. And I will not blot out his name of the book of life, but will confess him, his name before my father and before his angels. We'll be clothed in white garments with our name written in the book of life. Why white? White is a symbol of purity. Perfectly clean. White is a symbol of high office. The Roman officials were known to wear white on holidays and at religious activities. Christ will give the overcomers a white robe. Plus... Those who do not stain their clothes with, uh, and their lives with careless livings will have their name written in the book of life. Brothers and sisters, God's handbook requirements, pure living, unspotted garments, living each day as if it would be our last, intentional in our walk with the Lord, people of integrity, willing to turn the other cheek, going to second mile, Quick to repent when done wrong. Seeking forgiveness. All part of our, our, our requirement. And we're already keeping our garments pure on top of it all. A faithful witness for Christ, while on this side of eternity, will have a continual focus on our eternal home. Combined with pure living. Are our lives pure? Are our garments pure? Or are they spotted? The next one we see in chapter 3, verse 12. Him that overcometh... Why make a pillar in the temple of God? A pillar is a strong, steady, essential part of a building structure. And he was writing this to the church of Philadelphia. The church, this church was in a region known for a number of earthquakes. And several times the city was almost destroyed. After the earthquake, there's constant shocks that weaken buildings causing people to feel uneasy about living in this city. So he tells this church, these people, he said, you know, I'm going to make you a pillar. The Lord promises uh, that we, the overcomer will be a pillar. No earthquake is going to harm this city. And I had to ask the question, are we strong and steady in our spiritual lives on this side of eternity? Are you a pillar, a spiritual pillar for those looking on? Earlier I mentioned that we're supposed to be a positive example. Along with that, when people see you, do they see a strong spiritual pillar in your spiritual life? The Lord is looking for those who will persevere during the time, during the storms of life. A pillar in the midst of a storm. A prime example for those looking on. Jesus said, the overcomer will be a pillar in the house of God. Then go to chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in the throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. 
It's getting better as we go on. The overcomer is promised a seat with Christ in heaven. Which I hope and trust that's why we're here this morning. Just one more step before we can meet Christ face to face. Jesus said of this church, he said, you know, you guys are lukewarm. But the promise in verse 21 is for all who overcome the lukewarm indifference. The overcomer will be promoted to a seat near the throne of Christ when he, Christ comes to reign in his kingdom. There is no reward that could be of greater value than to be ushered to a seat near the throne of Jesus Christ. If you're an overcomer this morning, just picture that. You step into glory. You, you'll be welcomed. Welcome home, that good and faithful servant. Here is your crown. The streets of gold... We read about it, but what we're, the more important thing is we're going to see Christ face to face. And then someone's going to say, hey, here's your seat. Come sit down. And you're sitting there, and you're seeing Christ face to face. The, promise, the seven promises that I gave are seven promises for the overcomer, for those living in victory. Sometimes we sing, heaven will surely be worth it all. Amen. It certainly will be. We're here for a very short period of time, and then we're looking for our reward. In conclusion, we saw a few uh, requirements from God's handbook. God knows all about us. There is nothing that we can hide from him. What will his report be on your life? Will you be willing to take the remedy steps to repent, to hold fast, to hear, and to overcome? The rewards are for the overcomers. They will be fed from the tree of life. They will not be hurt. With a second death, they will be given of the hidden manna. They will reign with Christ, who is a bright morning star. Will be clothed in white garments, have their name written in the book of life, be a pillar in the temple of God, and promised a seat around the throne of Christ. The overcomers are those who are living faithful, victorious lives on this side of eternity, while looking forward and waiting for the day when we will meet Jesus Christ face to two face. God gave us his handbook for clear direction through life. Disobedience to his word will bring its consequences, but there will be a reward for the overcomers. Let's pray. Father, we come before you here this morning. Just thank you for the words of encouragement to the overcomers here in the book of Revelation. I pray, Lord, that we could be living on this side of eternity with clear, spot-free robes. Help us, Lord, just to have our lives unspotted from the world be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and living in victory. Thank you, Lord, for the victory that can be found only in you. Help us to tap into that power and that strength and to press forward one day at a time, giving you our everything and our all, serving you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, with our sights set on glory, looking forward to the day that we can see you face to face. Bless each soul here this morning. Help us, Lord, just to be prepared for that day. We thank you for your promises. In your name we pray. Amen. Eddie, we have a song, please.